That Great Business Show. Winner, Highly Commended Award, Irish Podcast Awards. Welcome to episode 170 of That Great Business Show, home of great business tips, insights, and opportunities on every episode delivered in our commute-friendly package. And all thanks to daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. If you're looking for your first home or looking to upsize or downsize your abode, do make sure to visit daft.ie to find that next place you will call home. If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. Whether you're looking for your first home or planning your next move, make sure you're on daft.ie, the best place to buy or sell in Ireland. Travel to Connecticut, USA with Aer Lingus service to Bradley International Airport. With the daily flights from Dublin to Hartford, we make business travel to Connecticut easy. Save time with US preclearance, enjoy Aer Lingus award-winning flight service and experience the convenience of Bradley International Airport, perfectly situated for your travel needs. Learn more and plan your next business trip at aerlingus.com. On this episode, as part of our Beachhead USA mini-series, the ultimate crib sheet for expanding into the US market, we have top tips on how not to bore US clients to death because they will walk out of your meeting in minutes if they don't find out what you're saying is of interest. We'll also bring you a selection of the best business books around. And we know the bots are coming, but we have a very, very different take on bots because we found one that will pay your taxes. Now, we're very lucky here at Team GBS HQ because we are sent many, many, many offers of great guests. We review them all and then choose mainly based on how much a guest might help with your business problems, be that through their company's products or services or through their real world experiences. And on this episode, we have done it again. We have found a man who is creating a bot that will pay your taxes literally. His is a fantastic story and the best bit is he's only 25 years old. So we are expecting some incredible things from him. No pressure then, Connor Kelly of TaxBot.ie. Welcome to That Great Business Show. Hi, Connor. Thanks for having me on. I was going to say you were 26 and you corrected me and you said you're 25, <laughs> which gives you an, an extra year to create even more brilliant ideas, items, bots, solutions, etc. Yeah, that's true. Well, you say it's an extra year because of COVID. I feel like we've lost two years, you know. Oh so. my God, you could have been <laughs> doing even more. Yeah. Now, this is the bit you don't want to talk about. You don't want to talk about your auditing background. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say I have much of an auditing background, to be honest. But you were with I, one of the larger firms. We won't, was, we won't name and shame no, them. No, we but, won't. We won't. Uh, but we, you found it so boring that you decided to do as all anybody who is in auditing should do: <laughs> get the hell out and get into and try to set up your own business. Yeah, effectively. So I kind of sleepwalked into the job, and this is a very common thing to happen in Dublin universities, Irish universities, just universities in general. People don't have a good idea of what the job market looks like when they're in third or fourth year. And you get these really attractive sort of offers from, you know, big four firms. And to, by all means, they are like great offers. You know, they'll they'll train you, they'll pay for your exams. You know, it's very social. There's, it's it's very, it's very quite hard to turn down. So naturally, people just sort of take these positions without actually really evaluating whether the job suits their personality and sort of what they want to do in the future. It didn't help that there was a pandemic that struck right as I was finishing college. So like the job market was basically obliterated overnight. So I had this one offer and it was like this or nothing else or like, you know, live in this pandemic. I didn't know it was going to end. So I, I took it and yeah, immediately it wasn't for me. I didn't like to be honest, I, I never really applied myself much to it because at the exact point when I began, I had this idea for zero fog, which is uh, what I have here in front of me, which is an anti-fog cloth for glasses. I, are you familiar with this? I am very familiar with this because yeah. I read your backstory. And this is because one of the, like if we go even back further, your original job, if I remember correctly, you were on a milk round. Uh, yeah, when I was like 15. That's yeah, a, well, yeah. that's a job. It's a job. Yeah, oh, it was a great job. I, so if you want to go all the way back, when I was 15, 16, uh, that, that was probably one of the best jobs ever because it was one, one day a week and I got tips. So it was great, you know, like it was, you, you know, everyone coming out giving you, oh, that's like a fiver for the milk and there's two euro for yourself and, and it would all add up. So I, I was making good money for a 15 year old, okay? But what working one day a week. But my social skills got really good because I was I was chatting with everyone and we had like 100 people, maybe 200 people. And I was going out and I was always engaging with people, got to know people over time. 
And it I really don't just think social skills were ever going to be a problem with you. You are <laughs> a natural, I think. Well, I think, I think it probably helps that I, you know, started early. Um, but anyway, so Milk Round got me to college. And then when I got into college, I did Ikea and McDonald's and I did DJing at, at one point. And that was actually a great gig for a while. And then the pandemic hit, no more DJing, no more clubs. Took the role in uh, the big four firm. Right at the, literally, honestly, you could have timed it within a week, the same week I joined. I had this idea for for Zero Fog. Which, which came out of your mammy. Which came out of my mammy, yeah, <laughs> indeed. So everyone was wearing glasses and a face mask. We're about six months into the pandemic. Complete disaster you know every like in terms of we didn't know where things were heading really in, at that point in time six months in it was we thought it was going to be over in a couple of weeks whatever but I wore, wear glasses we both wear glasses and they were fogging up the whole time I remember we were, it well yeah exactly so I did I was amazed to find it was a solution uh, to this and it was a terrible one and it was one called it's some chemical called hydrophilic something yeah or? it's like a hydrophilic solution so, so where did you find out about a hydrophilic solution <laughs> don't tell me YouTube did you and, well YouTube helps YouTube helps I, I, this one was, YouTube was, was incredible Google. just unbelievable <laughs> if we had ChatGPT at the time I probably would have <laughs> probably would have found out through ChatGPT but YouTube honestly YouTube pretty much helped me build the entire business like I got so much advice off YouTube the early days but yeah basically it, it puts the liquid in the cloth Wipes, just for people that listen, just so they get the context, Zero Fog is a cloth and it's wet with this hydrophobic solution. And when you wipe your glasses with the cloth, it applies this solution onto the lenses and it absorbs any moisture that hits them, basically stopping them from fogging up, right? And it comes in a resealable package so you can reuse it and, and maintains its moisture. So I had that idea and I went for it, went all in. I was thinking, you know what? There might only be two weeks, three weeks left in the pandemic. So let's go for it. It ended up lasting another year. Right. So I had a whole business then coming, like just emerging out of nothing. And at, at that point, I kind of had to choose, do I take this grad job that I just sleepwalked into and that I hate and I'm not really applying myself to, or do I go all in on the entrepreneurship? And I, I chose the latter. And Zero Fog is still available? Zero Fog is still going. We actually have these glasses cleaners now. I actually brought some for you, Connell. So, uh, <laughs> the, the desk is filling up here. <laughs> <laughs> so ba- basically, it's like a key ring glasses cleaner. So you attach it to your keys. And it's like a glass is cleaner on the go, so you no longer have to use your clothes to clean your glasses, basically. <laughs> and a lot of people still use Zero Fog for other purposes, going to the gym, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, as like just being like entrepreneurially focused, you, you kind of have to think, right, what's like the big thing that I'm going to apply my life to rather than like this was an opportunity that I solved and got me off the ground, got me over to London. You know, I was able to fund myself to go do my master's degree there. But I had to think when I when I went to do my master's degree, what's the biggest problem? that I can apply to my, my life to effectively. And AI, we were starting to emerge at that, at that point in time. This is like summer 2022. We had the first version of Mid Journey, which is like the image creator that's blowing everyone's mind. But like, these like really early days, the images looked really bad. But it was amazing that you could put in like Cristiano Ronaldo and like get some, get a footballer, you know, like it would it'd create a footballer. It didn't look like Ronaldo, but created a footballer. So I was like, okay, look, this is it. Like, this is what I'm going to put my life into. And, you know, Early, day, early days now, you know what I mean? 2025. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you have to, you just have to jump in. So I've jumped into that. And yeah, fast forward now, one year later, I've completed my master's degree in London, where I did my research on TaxBot, which we will get into, which is like AI and Irish taxes. And then I've also um, taken a job at Human Loop, which is an early stage startup where we provide software to help people actually put AI into their businesses and into their products. And it's a co-founder there is Irish as well, ex Trinity Peter Hayes, isn't that right? Yeah, Peter Hayes, co-founder there. And he did Trinity. He also did his master's in, in uh, he's actually doing a PhD in UCL. So he's the CTO there and he's co-founded it with Raza Habib, who's CEO, who also did his ML. And, and you met with him on a Tuesday and you were hired on a Wednesday? Yes, basically. I mean, literally uh, yeah. was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I met with Raza. Raza would be regarded as one of sort of the world's thought leaders on AI, basically. Like he's, you know, he's w- well sought after. But you also had another chance encounter with a guy called Sam Altman. Yeah, so How it was the same time. Of? It was. It happened at the same time. So, so Raza was giving a talk at this AI meetup and I met him there and introduced myself and we got chatting away. And then, I see you did some chat, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he offered me, like, he, he, he said there was a position there if I was interested, we could chat about it. And the next day, Sam Altman was in UCL and we were both there as well. So he said, well, I see you with Sam talk. I said, yeah. So we met Sam Altman, then I saw him again and he said, do you want to join us tomorrow? And I said, yeah. And then I haven't looked back since. That is fantastic. That's a great story. Yeah. That's the way to hire. Just say, it yeah, is. you're good. You're, you're on. You're in. <laughs> yeah, Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that is with a company called Human Loop. Human Loop, yeah. But Human Loop are encouraging you with TaxBot. 
dot i e. Yeah. So Do not look up tax bot anything else because I did and I found other ones, <laughs> which is a problem for you, mind so you. Tax, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, look, taxbot.ie, we only focus on Irish taxes. So, yeah. And you the told idea... me you're not going to pay the tax. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea for taxbot basically came about because I was in UCL and I was I was studying AI. And at Human Loop, we, we see a, a ton of like really good industry use cases for using large language models and, and putting AI into various... What are things. large language models, LLMs? LLMs. So LLMs are, these are the, the AI models that power things like ChatGPT. It's text in, text out. And... Give me a, a working example. What are you talking about? So these large language models are effectively like all the text data on the internet trained into this model is effectively and... It's so mad. It's crazy. It's 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 really, it's madness. Yeah. And they're actually running out of text. So Sam Altman actually said for the next version of ChatGPT, GPT-5, they, um, they're actually asking businesses to give them some some of their own data because they ran out of public data. There's no more public already. So it's it's getting crazy. And and by saying that, that is, you have access to that. So you can draw information out of the most obscure exactly. places. Yeah. So they've given all the text data in the world. And this model effectively has sort of figured out how things work together. Basically, you, you let the model figure it out itself. So when you say like, one good example would be like Vincent van Gogh. So it knows what Vincent van Gogh's it is, now, this is an image model, right? But it's kind of the same thing. So it knows what Vin- Vincent uh, van Gogh's painting would look like, for instance, okay? And then you would say a Nike shoe. You give it a Nike shoe, for instance, and, and it knows what Nike shoe. But then when you say, give me, you know, a Nike shoe designed by Vincent van Gogh, it can piece the puzzle together, even though it's never seen a, a Nike shoe. It can piece that together, right? So that, that's what we're dealing with. So nice the, idea as well. Yeah, it's, great. Yeah, yeah. People, sure, it's amazing. I mean. yeah, yeah. So basically what's happened, they've given it all the text data in the world, and this model has sort of figured out a world... It's called a world model. It's kind of figured out how the world works based on all the text data it's seen. And it's like drawn links between things. So that's a large language model. I knew that you were going to run out of time. So you better get onto your text spot. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> because otherwise you will be coming back to me. I know that. But Okay, uh, right. So for AI, we've seen a lot of good use cases going into professional services. And one area I thought that it was re- really necessary was in taxes because taxes touch on everything. And, you know, everyone has to pay their taxes. It's a huge industry. And generally, people don't know what they're doing when they're when it comes to taxes. It's very confusing. There's a lot of laws. Most people, sadly, when they look at their paycheck, they don't even know what, what's on there because they just know how much they get in their bank account. They don't know what they're looking at. So I was like, there's an information access issue here where the like general public don't have access to the right information and can't figure out how it applies to their use case. OK, so I said, OK, how, how can I use AI to solve this? And effectively, that's what my research is about. And I, I built this system called taxbot.ie. And what it is, is it's like chat GPT for your taxes. So it's an AI tax advisor. You sit down with it and you text it and it will text you back. And when you give it information about who you are, what you do, your business, et cetera, et cetera, and then ask it a tax question, it will basically look at your profile, look at the entire tax legislation that exists in Ireland, all the tax law, and basically give an answer to you based on whatever context you've given it. I'm sure I'm not the only one who would have thought this was very funny. What happens when you text it? How can I evade taxes? <laughs> it will just tell you it can't help you with that. It doesn't. So it can't, it can't help a crime. That's like straight up. Like, that's like embedded in the models. Like it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And it's actually, it's not necessarily designed to sort of minimize taxes either. It's more just designed to like help you understand compliance and actually understand the rules. That's like, most of the use cases. So if I'm earning a thousand quid a week, yeah, I will go onto the website and what will it tell me that I have to pay 52% or whatever it is? Is yeah. that it? So, That's it. Uh, so you're not actually paying my taxes. It, but it, it'd be, it's used for more complex situations. Like, but you could do that, right? So you, you would go on, you would tell a, like, like you know, I, I earn a grand a, a week or whatever you're saying. And, you know, this is my job. I'm married, single, these are my tax credits, etc. You give it all that information. Now, we want to make it as easy as possible to gather that information. So maybe it's just fill in a form or you could like give us a link to some of your business profile or whatever. But, but essentially, it has all that context. So yeah, when you do go and say, I got paid a thousand this month, how much do I owe in tax? It'll be able to fire back an answer and say, you owed it, uh, X amount. But that's sort of downstream from what we're really working on right now, which is small business owners and accountants themselves. So we want to help accountants, first of all, figure out to save time. And then we actually want to help small business owners 
not waste their accountant's time by asking questions that can easily just be answered by something like tax well. And in theory, this should make people's taxes cheaper, as in getting the tax advice. In, as in, theory, in, in Yeah, quite possibly. Now, let's see how it plays out with all these things. When, when, when you launch a product, usually the market behaves differently. You don't, you don't exactly know how the market's going to react, right? And what my what I want to do is I want to get it out into the market so that I can understand, okay, who's getting the real value here? And then double down. My intuition is that at the very beginning, you're going to see a lot of accountants take this up because they have a direct economic incentive to save time and use this system to start getting speeding up just tax advisory and, and, and getting their taxes ready for their clients. But ultimately, it could end up in the hands of small business owners who may end up, yes, paying less for tax advisory. Considerably less. Yes, considerably less. And look, have you got a pricing model yet? Yeah, we do have a, a pricing model. Like more details come up upon launch, but it's an affordable monthly subscription. And yeah, so. And you will be launching very soon. Now, another curious thing is it sat the tax exams yeah. and it got 90%. But you tell me that it could get 101%. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could go beyond 100%. It's, it's almost there. So yes, basically, how do you evaluate a system like this, right? So, okay, great. I have this AI tax advisor. It's like this AI bot. Okay, how do I know it's good? Well, how do you know any accountant's good? You give them a set of exams and then you give them, you know, the, the license to go out and, and participate in the market. So effectively, I was doing my master's thesis. So this was part of my thesis. I was like, how can I evaluate this system? And I said, OK, I, I just got the past exams, the chartered accountants exams, tax exams. And I sat down, got the solutions and I gave the tax bot the entire exam, corrected the solutions. And I went through this rigorously. I did it three times over. And yeah, it beats 90 percent of accountants. And where it did fall down was very uh, solvable issues that um, were related to the database. And we can, yeah, like upon launch, we want to be saying 99 to 100 percent. So, And it will launch soon. Yeah. Why only Ireland? I mean, I presume is it just because of different tax code everywhere, which is good. It's, it's, a bit of a problem. It's a good question. This, this is more of a, this more comes down to the strategy of when you're launching a tool, okay, do you want to have a really, really good tool for a specific market or do you want to have an average tool for a broad market? OK, and in some cases, you know, you can argue either. But in this case, you want to have a really, really good tool that doesn't screw up your taxes and is very applicable to one market rather than trying to have a really poor one that's applicable to every market. So that's my thinking behind it. And I presume that there will be many, many, many terms and conditions that you're not liable for anybody's taxes and your own sure. problem and, and, and. Yeah. Now, that is tax spot because you have other ideas as well. Share them, please. Other plans or other ideas of uh, products that you might be able to develop. Am I right? In, in well, what? for example, one of them was that you were going to do is the, you were going to have a Gmail, oh, sorry, an email. Gmail. An so that's email already launched. Writer. That's already, so Genie Mail, yeah, yeah. Genie Mail, I launched that in uh, March of, of this year. Is uh, that because you weren't busy? <laughs> was, Remind me again, you're sitting your UCL exams, yeah. you're uh, doing, you're meeting with Sam Altman, <laughs> you're working for Human Loop, you're doing textbot.ie. And you just got this other email thing out. Yeah, what, does email, I think, what, what does the email thing do? So basically, it's a it's a Chrome extension. So if you're Google Chrome, if you're on Google Chrome and you use Gmail, it's a button that sits inside your Gmail inbox. And basically, if, if you don't like writing your emails, you're a bit lazy, you just press it and it will read whatever email you've gotten. You tell it what you want it to reply and it'll create that reply for you. And it all just, you don't have to leave Gmail, it just sits inside your Gmail inbox. Yeah. Well, what you did tell me is that you can't really make any money out of its own. Chrome, Chrome, Chrome extensions are difficult to market and difficult to make money. Either they work really well and you get like tens of millions of downloads or they don't. And uh, in this case, I, I, I'd rather solve sort of like real problems that have like a long term horizon, such as like taxbot.ie and such the work we're doing at Human Loop as opposed to just trying to like promote a Chrome extension that does this. But if if you are interested and you don't like writing emails, it is a free tool. You can download it at genemail.ai and yeah, you, it might save you some time during your day. And it's, as you say, it's free. So you're actually doing people a favour, a big favour. I'm doing people, yeah, a big favour <laughs> with, with that one. Yeah. Final question, because you will be coming back. I mean, I could talk to you all day because <laughs> <laughs> fascinating is we ask everybody, who would they hire in a heartbeat? Who would yeah. you go for? So, He's a bit older than me now. I just checked before we went on. He's seven to seventy-three, so maybe in an alternative, I probably would hire him in a heartbeat anyway. But you know, if if you know we we're just starting out or whatever, it would be uh, Steve Wozniak. And the reason why it would be Steve Wozniak is because he, you know, Apple wouldn't have been built without Steve Wozniak, right? You had Steve Jobs, the amazing designer and salesman, and then you had Steve Wozniak, the amazing technical co-founder, the amazing computer programmer, arguably the guy who actually created 
the Apple, the first Apple one, it was Steve Jobs who then went out and sold it. So when you're starting a business, like any tech, any, like I would say this to any entrepreneur is if you're not technical, you need a really good technical co-founder and not just someone who just did a computer science degree. And because most likely you don't really know what qualifies a really good technical co-founder. So what I've done throughout, like since I've graduated, I did best in Trinity. So I didn't have any technical. I've applied myself as much to technology as possible. So I know what a good technical co-founder looks like. And that's basically, that's sort of like now my thinking is, how could you do anything without someone who can actually do the, the computing lift? So the reason I say Steve Wozniak is basically if if I can hire someone in a harpy, it's the best possible technical co-founder that I can find who I can work with that will help grow and build whatever it is that we that we know, He on. made me laugh because he appeared on an episode of The Big Bang, Bang Theory. Did you ever see him there? No. He appears as Steve Wozniak. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the boys are, you know, wetting themselves at the idea <laughs> of meeting with him. So um, I presume you're going to send uh, Mr. Wozniak an email and asking him, he'll probably reply with using G, Gmail and say, good luck on your bike. <laughs> we will hear from you very, very soon again. But have you just, because I'm curious about this, have you got any other little side hustles? You don't have to name them or... You've got other, I mean, you, it's good, you are it's so full of ideas. Yeah, yeah. No, at, at the minute, at the minute, no, it's, it's, I, I'm, fu- I'm full up with what we're doing at Human Loop and then like TaxBot as well. And yeah, like, but I'm sure, I'm sure ideas will, will, will come as, as we progress. And you will but, come back to us on yeah. that great business. The, right? har- the hardest thing is like, you need to stay focused, right? Like as a, like as a, when, when you're entrepreneurial or whatever, like you have a lot of ideas. It's not about it's not about how many ideas you have. It's like how many like ones can you just focus on and narrow down and, and that's that's what I'm trying to do now. So Connor Kelly, founder of Taxbot.ie, and I'm sure many, many other things, including Zero Fog, which is sitting in front of me here. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thanks, Connor. It's been great. That great business show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. Are you buying or selling a home? If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. Travel to Connecticut, USA with Aer Lingus service to Bradley International Airport. With the daily flights from Dublin to Hartford, we make business travel to Connecticut easy. Save time with US pre-clearance, enjoy Aer Lingus award-winning flight service and experience the convenience of Bradley International Airport, perfectly situated for your travel needs. Learn more and plan your next business trip at aerlingus.com. That Great Business Show. Winner, highly commended award. Irish Podcast Awards. You know that as an entrepreneur, you wouldn't get out of bed if you didn't believe the world or your business was going to get better. There's a thing called negativity bias. It's when our attention is drawn to the bad news or the bad images. We're drawn to the bad stuff more than the good. And that, psychologists tell us, is because people whose brains gave priority to bad news were much less likely to be eaten by lions or the like. Negative predictions sound more certain to us, and of course, mostly those negatives just aren't true at all. After all, the majority of us live longer, healthier, and higher quality lives than previous generations. Now, what has that got to do with books? You see, we knew you'd ask that question, so we asked one of our favourite Team GBS members, Maria Dickinson, boss of the Dubray chain of bookstores, back to tell us that predictions of the demise of books were wrong, 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 and why we should buy, buy, buy business books from local bookstores just like hers. And of course, as someone running a successful business herself, we want to pick her brains about which business books she'd choose to read. Maria Dickinson, welcome back to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. And it's been a while, I think. It might have been during COVID you were last in with us. That's right. Last time I was in with you, I think it was in the autumn of 2021. We were definitely masked up and I had just opened a shop downstairs in Dundrum Town Centre. And since then, you have been growing the brand 
and the branches. Do you like the way I did that? A bit of alliteration. Yeah, beautiful. Does that do? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Since then, you've opened another one in Waterford. That's right. We've opened in Waterford. We've also opened in uh, Mary Street in Dublin and in Swords Pavilion Shopping Centre as well. And we've replatformed the website. So, so it's not just busy. go, go, go. It's grow, <laughs> grow, grow. You've doubled in seven years. You took over seven years ago, am I right? Uh, yes, yeah, pushing eight, but yeah. yeah. And uh, you've doubled the... Uh, Absolutely, yeah, we've gone from eight to... And that, 30. conveniently, is despite all the naysayers saying that bricks and mortar and bookshops, it was all over. Well, that's it. Um, I mean, referring to your introduction, there aren't too many lions in the book trade, but there have certainly been threats um, over my my years in the trade. I mean, obviously, when Amazon came in as a player in the market, that was deemed a considerable threat to bricks and mortar book selling and, and, and is to a certain extent still today. And then, of course, the Kindle was the great big what are you going to do when you get fired? Um, Conversation for several years. Um, People thought that the paper book was just gone um, and we weathered that as well. Um, Audiobooks, again, was a little, you know, sniper sniper in the woods. And then, of course, COVID um, was a serious threat. You know, our businesses were closed. We had to pivot online. A lot of change and creativity, but to be a bookseller is to be an eternal optimist and we have come out swinging. And it sounds like you're in business because all businesses are given a suck to the eye, a suck to the ear, a suck to the jaw. It doesn't matter. Every business takes a few body blows, yeah? That's it. That's it. And we've been really heartened by over all of these challenges by just how much people love the physical book and the act of going into a bookshop and engaging and getting recommendations and all that lovely stuff. And I saw something about you, Bray, that you call yourself a dedicated bookshop. Now, what is a dedicated bookshop to, as opposed to anything else? I suppose another word you could use is specialist. You know, we really are focused on books and books only. You know, there's this, that love of the product and recommendation that, you know, books are our, our way of life, if you like. You know, there are other retailers that have different mix of offers and, and sell books and other things, whereas uh, books are our passion. And yet, when we go back to Amazon and some of the other threats, one of the things about Amazon is just a click away. What have you done to try to take on that single click, making it easier and easier for people to get the books that they want? Well, we've tackled it in two ways. I mean, online, you know, our online offer, and I always say this, is, you know, Irish, it doesn't, you've got dubraybooks.ie, you have other Irish um, book retailers, you know, with next day delivery, all of that convenience and ease and simplicity is there. And what's better about Irish bookselling websites, you go onto Amazon and once you've waded through all the other stuff that they sell and finally find the books page now, it's the UK bestsellers. It's the big celeb autobiographies. It's not what the Irish reader wants. Um, and we offer comparable, if not better value on those titles that are actually relevant to Irish readers and Irish book lovers. So. Because of the algorithms, mm-hmm. because the algorithms are choosing what people are being offered, isn't mm-hmm. that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've worked very hard, as I said, we replatformed our, our website. We've got a huge range um, on offer there and, and fantastic service. So I would recommend that people, before they automatically go to Amazon as the no-brainer thing to do, look for your local book retailer because you will find great value and great service there. And then in stores, really it's the experience of going into a bookshop that's the different, um, that, that marks us out. It's that conversation you can have with a bookseller, the recommendation and the serendipity, you know, being able to find something you didn't know you wanted, but is fascinating and could be a total curveball in terms of what you read. That is, the, you see, your drug dealers. It's <laughs> the serendipity, you call it. You find something that you didn't want or didn't know you wanted. And it's so true. When I go into a bookshop, when anybody goes into a bookshop, they're looking for one book, probably, how many do they normally walk out with? Um, the average Debray, three. So you're, yeah, you see, you see yeah. what you've done. Mm-hmm. And how We're often, terrible people. <laughs> any, any idea how often man, woman, child goes in? The same person, in other words. Yeah, you? our customers are certainly our loyalty customers. So we'd, we'd, have, we'd be able to have a better sense of how they behave. They'd be in at least once a month, which is, you know, it's, it's important for us to know that because we have to make the shop a little bit different and a little bit fresh every time they, they come in. How do so. you do that? We work very hard. If you go into a Debray store, you'll find we do different curations, different sort of topical curations or themes. I see that Mary or John recommend yes, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the personal recommendations are really important. I look at those and I'm doing. such a cynical old so-and-so that I wonder, are they real? Oh, no, they're absolutely genuine. And you find, I mean, the bestseller, our top 10 bestseller in each store, you know, when you go in, you'll see that they're, they're different by store. So that's what, Are they? So Dundrum at the moment is selling A History of Maps by Pat Liddy. That's their number one. Whereas, um, where did I go into next? Um, I was in Rathmines the other day and they, they had a fiction book at number one. So it really, we try very hard to be 
your local bookseller, not a chain bookseller, but to every person who goes in, it's their local bookshop. And what about variations across the country? Are there very, very big variations of what people are buying? You know what? Even between Black Rock and Stillorgan, which are, what, a mile and a half apart, huge differences in the customer base. It's fascinating. It really is. It's it's it's. It, it's a really interesting business. In and Kindle, despite all the prognostications, did not go and kill you, nor the audiobooks. Are audiobooks on the wane again? or um, It's slightly hard to get the data on that. I think they are still quite strong, but I think the audiobook market just augmented people's reading. I listen to audiobooks and I do it in the car when I'm not capable of reading other books. It just gives me the opportunity to absorb more books. Um, so that's great. You're that it doesn't meant stop to me from reading. say <laughs> that you listen to podcasts. And podcasts. Of course. Of course. <laughs> so all of the, the threats you just kind of like people do, you've just written them out. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. They've all been serious challenges. And, you know, on a on a more sort of sobering note, you you do have to think hard about how you do things, how you're better, how you can be more creative, how you can be more interesting. It's not easy. And, you know, particularly for, you know, the, the, the Irish market has some fantastic standalone indie stores and it's very hard work, but brilliant, resilient bunch of booksellers. They really are. And since everybody's talking about it, will chat GPT or AI, will that make any difference to you at all or should it or could it? It, it could. I mean, you certainly have the, you know, depending on how much publishers want to engage with it, you can have, you know, books turned out. But I mean, to me, and again, going back to the the serendipity, it's the spark, it's the creativity, it's the human nature of a well-written book that I think, maybe I'm a Luddite, but I think that's very hard to, to recapture. Well, I hope so. And what about, since we are a business podcast even, what are people reading in terms of business books? And you know me, or maybe you don't know me, but I have told you previously, not a huge fan of business books, am I? Well, Interestingly, this year, um, looking at the, uh, the the sales of books, forty percent of business books in Ireland over the last year have been by or about Sean Quinn, <laughs> which is quite something. Okay, <laughs> well, now I don't want to get in front of a high court judge, but maybe that's not just about business. Because <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 that's, you, that's you an might, inter- that's an interesting life story. There's, you, a, there's exactly. a, a wide and angle lens there. And you yes, might yes, also right. learn how not to do business. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think he plays so himself. But in terms of the ones that I would be, you know, if I was on the shop floor talking to customers at the moment, if people were were, were coming in to look for a good recommendation. Two particularly that I that I'd recommend, which would just be you know, they're fascinating stories, but real rip roaring reads. You know, rather like you, I find you know sometimes business books can be a little bit on the dry side, whereas these both have the pace of a thriller. Really fascinating, really interesting books. So the first one is Ben Mesrick's Breaking Twitter. Now, obviously, you've got the Elon Musk biography by Walter Jacobson, which is the big heavy tome, but this is the this is the scrappy outsider, um, and it's great fun. It really is a breakneck recounting of all of the chaos that has ensued at, at Twitter since um, Elon Musk took over oh, up to a point. <laughs> I was going to say, it continues. I just saw a lovely reference and it was on X or Twitter and somebody referred to X as, I can't believe it's not Twitter. And I just loved that. I thought that was really clever. Yeah, that chimes. But, but one of the issues about that book, and I haven't read it, but it is of a moment in time because the man continues with his wrecking ball. It is. It only goes up to uh, February 23, so doesn't actually include the moment when it became X, for example. And yes, that, that story is ongoing, but it's it's a brilliant detail. He also wrote a book called The Accidental Billionaires about the, the origins of Facebook. And he said he just captures that energy and pace and lunacy really, really well, well. lunacy I think might come before <laughs> the other two yeah there is a second book you were going to recommend sorry yes the uh, the, the second one there um, which again is just an incredible page turner is um, Michael Lewis's Going Infinite um, you'd know him of course from we do, The Big yes. Short and Moneyball and many other books he's an incredible writer and an cre- incredible investigator so this book follows the meteoric rise and desperate fall of Sam Bankman fried um, so really getting um, into the, the whole crypto world. Except, and I do follow and I have followed that story, is that as what I read about it, and I haven't read the book, I read the reviews, I always do that, is that uh, it was, uh, he was a little bit easy on Bankman Freed because Bankman Freed was a naughty, naughty boy who stole an awful lot of money. And I think he's in jail now. And they, when you go to jail in America, you stay there mm-hmm. for a very, very long time. So uh, that Mr. Lewis was not, he seemed to have extra access to him. 
Yes, I, it's, I, I'm always fascinated by these books and the, the, the same actually with the, the Elon Musk book, the, the Walter Jacobson, which isn't always entirely complimentary, but there's a, an element of, should we say ego perhaps with... Um, <laughs> a business person with an ego. <laughs> that they're happy to give access to get the profile to have the book, but then it doesn't necessarily play out exactly the way they not, like it. It is not, so I yeah. shouldn't run it that way. With her. Now, there's a third book that I think you want to reference which is by a man called Enda McNulty that many, many people in the GA will know. Commit to lead, unlock your true leadership potential. Indeed. We we love to support Irish authors um, whenever we can. And Enda is a really inspirational business writer. And what I like about this one, it's very accessible and it doesn't just apply to business. It's it's leading in any area that you choose to lead in. So, um, you know, in your voluntary work, in, you know, um, environmental work, in a family environment in any any kind of organisation. So it's a very broad-based and Enda is, is just the most energetic man, full of good, sound advice and positivity. You sound like you like these kinds of books and I'm just wondering, do you apply it to your life, be that in home or at work or wherever? Do you, you know, all this kind of stuff about leadership, do you well, use it in Dubrai? I think we've talked about I'm Simon Sinek before, who would be one of my favourite business writers. I just love his ethos and I love the way he communicates. So for me, Start With Why, which I'm sure I've bored you about before, is, you know, for anyone trying to sort of get, get under the bonnet of their business and, and try to understand what motivates their team to get up and do things in the morning. I mean, for me, I read it and it's, you know, in Debray, quite simple. We all love books and we all love talking to people. And that is what you have to hold off. That's why we all get up. That's why we do it. There are all sorts of other things to it, but those are the, that's the, the nub of it. And as Tom Murphy, our great supporter of Pamex, would tell us, and the de facto shaving solution, do good. If yes. you're doing good in business, you're not going to go too far wrong because you do good, obviously. So um, maybe that's a two... That's a could I write a book in two words, you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be nice large print anyway. <laughs> oh, it would be actually. Maybe lots of illustrations. Do many. One of the issues is uh, a lot of these books are by non... I don't mean this in a, <laughs> any silly way. Non-Irish authors. Do you get many Irish business books? Not too many, to be honest with you. I mean, it is a small enough market. It's, uh, I think, of about 170 million worth of sales in the Irish market in 2022. About 2 million of that was, was business books. So it's, it's a small enough market. But that said, I mean, from a book selling perspective, we always love to have Irish authors, particularly Irish authors who will get out and talk energetically about their books and, and engage readers. So and we, when we you welcome say them when we see them. Get them out talking. Do you want them in your bookshops or on TV or where do you want them? Anywhere, um, everywhere? I mean, yes, a lot of... A lot of book selling. I mean, obviously, we we hand sell when people come in and look for recommendations, but a lot of it is driven by media, by podcasts, by good interviews that capture people's imagination, and then they. they well, come you won't to get those here, so you may as well move on. <laughs> Are you looking for Irish business leaders or Irish business people? Doesn't matter if they're leaders or not to write books. I mean, that would always always be welcome. I mean, we have one of the other books I was going to bring to your attention was the Steve Bartlett's Diary of a CEO, which is you know his thirty three laws of success. Brilliant. You know, it's great to have. It's, it's, it's sold very well. But having the equivalent from an Irish author where you've got, you know, Irish examples, Irish context would be very powerful. Steve Bartlett, for those who don't know, is one of the um, sharks on the, not the sharks, one of the dragons on the dragons. <laughs> because it is the shark tank in the US. He He's one of the dragons. And he has a massive following on social, which is what he was or is. I think he's a marketeer, isn't he, mm -hmm. by trade. And he's got a huge podcast, so I hate him. Well, I was I did hesitate to recommend it because, as you know, you are the only business podcaster in my life. Um, and, and obviously this is you know, far inferior than anything you do, but, but uh, it's, it's certainly popular. But again, I come back to you. You are promoting these books. You're selling these books. Do you ever read The 33 Laws of Success? And if I were to ask you, and I'm not going to because it'd be unfair, just in case. Would you know one of the laws of success? I could tell you two of them. Go on. <laughs> there were two that I picked out. Um, oh, you did yeah, well, I did, I did, you? I You're well I'm, a, I'm a very swatty. Um, the first was, and I, although, um, you know, depending on your view of the man, you, you might not uh, agree that this is his, his uh, way of operating, but his, um, one of the rules is that you must... You must never disagree if you're trying to win someone over. You should always find the common ground to Have start you with. seen him on Dragon's <laughs> Den? There is, I, uh, I have heard this term used before. He spells team with the word letter I. 
It's a bit him. I, I think there may be a little bit of do as I say and not as I do with that particular rule, in fairness. And um, that was rule one. That the was second rule. The other one that I liked, and to be honest, it, it rather caught my attention because I didn't understand what it meant when I read the headline, but it said, lean into bizarre behaviour. And I thought, what? What are you talking about? This word or this term to lean, lean in. in. I know, no, I know. No. Let's, let's, let's gloss over that. But his point in there is that it's easy to get complacent in business. And, you know, if something unusual happens in your market to say, oh, That'll pass. I know. I know. I know how things work. That you should take seriously any new curveballs, any erratic like, like Amazon, trends. like Kindle, mm, like um, yeah. the the, the uh, audiobooks. They all came your way. Did you lean into them? <laughs> <laughs> we were certainly, you know, we were cognizant of them coming. We took actions to. So in that sense, yes. And they can be small things. They can be big things. But I, I did think that was an interesting rule. It's quite a simple book. Um, so you know, there's a lot in it that if you're a a seasoned business uh, reader you'll be familiar with, but it's um, it's it's good and accessible and uh, certainly just very popular. To be clear, you are mm. a bookseller, not I a book am. publisher. Yeah. But if I were to ask you, if there's somebody's listening now, man or woman, to this, and they would say, "I'd like to write a business book." How would one go about writing a business book? Um, there is a great. Um, tool called the Writers and Artists Yearbook, which I would recommend anybody <laughs> At a good up. bookshop near you. At a good shop, and uh, indeed. go in there and buy another three books as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That gives very good guidance on how to contact publishers, how to get yourself an agent. Some people self-publish. That is quite a hard road to go down, I will say, particularly in a smaller um, pool. Um, so the, the best way to go really is to engage with that. And Irish publishers are very, you know, it's probably as a market, they're more open to to new ideas and, and creativity than perhaps some of the, um, you know, the UK. Or but America you will not be it. retiring on the proceeds? Not, no, 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 no. no I wouldn't a vanity no. project? Um, an extra string to your bow. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like Mr. Bartlett, I think we'll agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> Final one that you have on a list here in front of me is by a man called Chris Miller and it's about the chip wars. And this is really interesting. Now, this is not a 10 ways to be a better leader. This actually puts a whole lot of things into context. Absolutely. This is a fascinating book. It really did um, broaden my horizons, I have to say. So it's looking at the battle really for the production of chips, which when you think about it, are so fundamental to modern life in every way. Um, And it looks particularly at America, who used to make their own, and that was a massive part of the business. They started to outsource to Taiwan, to, to Korea, to get things moving more quickly and more cheaply but are coming to realise that that is a threat in various ways, both in terms of what that technology might entail and also in terms of, you know, being undercut and the money going elsewhere. China spends more on chips than it does on oil every year. This is absolutely phenomenal business. And who controls the chips? Really, this book is saying controls controls the world. So it's military, it's geopolitical, it's, it's, it's economic power resides in these tiny little items. And, you know, it's it's one of those books, you know, you go about living your life and think think you understand capitalism and you read this and you think, wow, there's, there's, there are forces at play here that could change the world. And they know where you're driving to and who you're mm-hmm. talking to mm-hmm. and everything. So mm-hmm. all of your paranoia can live in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sobering read, uh, but fascinating. So there are your five. I'm going to read them all out again. I just make sure that everybody knows of them. Breaking Twitter by Ben Mesrich. Going Infinite by Michael Lewis. Commit to Lead, which is the only Irish one on on your list. Unlock Your True Leadership Potential by Enda McNulty. Diary of a CEO. 33 Laws of Success. wonder why I didn't go 32 or 34 or 33. (laughs) That's by Steve Bartlett and Chip Wars, which is, for me now, is the outstanding one there. Chris Miller. And uh, yeah, I I have read reviews of that and uh, because that's what I do. I don't read the actual books. <laughs> I say, digest. <laughs> basically, actually, the Reader's Digest, that, that it did disappear, didn't it? I think it did. It did, yeah. okay. Now, you do know, because you have been on with us before, what our final question is. And that is when I asked Maria Dickinson, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Um, I, I have a history of going long with this question, as you might recall, and um, I'm excelling myself <laughs> in that regard this year. Um, at Dubray, we hire for... Three things. We hire for passion for books. We hire for expertise, knowledge of books and people who can communicate those things well. So I was thinking long and hard about this question. A lot, lot of thought into my preparation for the uh, for this. I course. can see that. Absolutely. And um, quite like to hire Barack Obama if, if he happens oh, if to he's be around, free. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you see him, would you just say? <laughs> um, because, I mean, as you're probably aware, he does his his 
twice yearly recommendations. Books, films, everything. But his book recommendations are, they're really good for starters. There's some fantastic, the ones that I've read in common with him, I've absolutely loved. And they're broad. So like that, we like a bookseller who can recommend a good nonfiction, a good fiction book, a good current affairs book. So he has that. And of course, he is a consummate communicator. Um, absolutely fabulous. So there we go. That's, that's, we're, we're, we're going high this year. That communications <laughs> thing reminds me when you're hiring and uh, you're obviously always on the lookout mm. for great readers, communicators and all. Difficult? I think as retailers go in Dubray, we are lucky. We do tend to attract staff who are interested in books. Um, Get away, really? Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we have been lucky over the years. We've got some fantastic staff and we're incredibly grateful to have them, lucky to have them. There has been a shift, I think, in terms of what incoming staff members are looking for. They like a little bit more flexibility in terms of work-life balance and days worked and so on. So perhaps days of a, a sort of a long-term five days a week career bookseller are changing anyway. People might be looking for a, a three-day week or um, to work in different ways. So we're trying to accommodate that and making sure our training works in that context. I'm curious again now, if they're doing a three-day week, what are they doing for the other four? Do they take it easy or do they study? Or a lot of they... them would have other projects or work across two jobs, just they like the variety. The nature of the people we hire, quite often artists or do you... actors or, you know, have other artistic interests that they like to spend time with. So when you're hiring, mm -hmm. what's the process? What's the uh, the, the interview process? Well, we have an excellent HR manager who has kept very busy these days. Um, so, as I said, I mean, those are the things that we're really looking out for is someone with a passion but for books. Is your HR manager, manager, and I don't know if it's a man or woman, if uh, they are sitting there, she, it's a she, is that, are the, is she uh, sitting and asking, are you an artist or are you, uh, you know, what's the question there? Oh, well, she'd be finding out about, really about their, I mean, you can assess someone's communication skills through the course of an interview. So that goes without saying, but it's that passion and knowledge for books. And it doesn't have to be across the range. You know, we have some staff members who are you know, avid science fiction readers or avid history buffs. Um, we have people with specific areas of expertise and that's as welcome as people who have a broad I'm knowledge. going down to see how much they know about business books now. <laughs> <laughs> Final question is, you, I'm going to leave the microphone open to you just for a few minutes as to, it's not a question, it's a statement, is that why should somebody support local bookstores? So many reasons. How long do I have? You keep going. <laughs> well, from the customer perspective, I think um, the experience of going into a bookshop is like no other. You know, there there are infinite choices there for you and a great opportunity to. Now, I will say communicate, chat with your bookseller, get recommendations. That said, some of our customers are real introverts and like to truffle away by themselves and we can see them coming and we leave them to it. We won't be bothering you if you don't want to talk, but we are there for those conversations and those recommendations as well. So I think I mentioned to you earlier as well the the serendipity, the the ability to discover something new, which will never happen online. Online, fine, you can get what you set out for, or you can get algorithm recommend something similar, but it's finding that quirky new love of your life book um, that you wouldn't you wouldn't otherwise come across. And Jeff Bezos has enough money as well. Exactly, exactly. And I have also used, and it's not because you're sitting here, but as I do try to support uh, Dubray, and I have used your system. It works beautifully. And it delivers to my door. Thank you very much. And I, keep, I do that to and keep out quickly. of bookstores so that you don't <laughs> sell more books to me. Maria Dickinson, as always, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you very much. If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. Whether you're looking for your first home or planning your next move, make sure you're on daft.ie, the best place to buy or sell in Ireland. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go at Corsi Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. Our Beachhead USA mini series is that great business show's way of helping scaling Irish businesses set up and succeed, establishing in the hugely lucrative US market. We're getting insights and tips, even some opportunities from the great and the good who know their way around business in the US. 
Fergot O'Sullivan probably knows more than most about selling in the US. It's different, very different. And that's because Fergal's business, USAM Group, that is what it does for a living. They help foreign businesses sell in the US. And Fergal O'Sullivan is with me. Fergal O'Sullivan, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you for having me. Selling is different, very different. Yes, it is very different here. That is true. Well, explain why, how, sell me your business, sell me selling in the US. Sure. So it's a bit like Churchill used to say, um, America and England are separated by a common language. And I think that applies equally to sales. Um, over in the States, and especially now, I would be talking, Connell, about uh, business to business sales, typically, um, at an enterprise level. There is a different set of expectations here for how you are going to engage with people, um, which is somewhat drawn by, you know, relationships and things that would be common in any country. But also there is, you know, a difference where America is comprised of so many different cultures, so many different, you know, people with so many different backgrounds that it's impossible to fully understand your client the way you can in a country where there's more of a common background. And so it requires much more time spent listening, understanding, and sort of drawing out of your prospects, um, you know, the challenges they truly face and how you might be able to uh, help them solve them. And if I were to meet you in a pub and we were talking about selling to Americans in America, you tell me some funny stories about how different things are. Please, for the next some minutes, do amuse me with some of the anecdotes. Well, I mean, um, one time I was selling a very large project to a news information organization, and I had an ex-Vietnam veteran colonel as the CEO of the on the other side of the table who was displeased with the presentation that we were making and how we were going to address his challenges. You did say displeased, not just pleased. <laughs> I did say displeased. And this was back in the 90s when maybe bad language wasn't as commonplace as it tends to be now. And you may use any words you wish. This is our podcast. Well, Nobody thank you. Person. I'm going to follow my mother. I, I will expect my mother is listening, so <laughs> I will try not to. <laughs> But I got an earful um, uh, from this man uh, who uh, physically threatening me. Um, Get away. Yeah, with bad language. And he was capable of you know, following through on his threats. So um, now that was a bit of an extreme one. But I wouldn't expect that um, if I was in Ireland somewhere. Um, we'd probably just have a disagreement and have a pint anyhow and get on with it. And that was back then. Yes. More laterally. What is, assuming that the people have calmed down and they're, well, obviously, the whole Vietnam thing is way behind us. It is. What can you expect and how can you avoid getting in trouble when yeah. selling? So I guess the single biggest issue that most people suffer from in sales is the show up and throw up approach. Can um, we tell what you oh, mean? Yeah. That's when people like to go to meetings and talk entirely about themselves and what they do and why it's so wonderful and why everybody should appreciate it. And as I mentioned in the States, you often don't really know who you're talking to or what their motivation is um, and why they're even, you know, here for the meeting. Yeah, so that's a curiosity. Explain that because this is new to me now. Yeah, well, they would often, um, you know, have come from, um, you know, different backgrounds and things. So where, you know, we might have grown up with Bosco, I don't know, I'm aging myself a little there. <laughs> uh, Blue Peter, I don't know, for if you're English, um, you know, these types of shows and things. You know, in the States, you've got people from every country in the world, and in particular in New York, and, and, and that's where we are now. People often ask me why I haven't picked up an American accent after all the time I've been here. And it's because I don't really interact with Americans that much. I, I interact with people from all over the world all the time. So I can't assume that I understand their body language. I can't understand, you know, their, their, their tones, their inflections in their speech. I have to be, you know, 
very clear. It, it really, it's incumbent actually on the speaker in, in America to make sure that the listener understands what you mean. Whereas in other countries where there's more of a shared heritage, you can throw out, um, you know, comments and expect them to understand what you meant by it. So that's more on the language and the culture and and the, that angle. But but also when it comes to business here, there's uh, a lot of regulation that's going to be quite different to the states. A lot of it has been developed because of the diversity here, but it is baked in now to the system. So when you start engaging with a with a large firm, they have a massive procurement team. They typically have you know computer systems for having you apply to solve their needs, um, and there will, there might be a hundred hundred and fifty questions that you need to answer backgrounds and everything else. So so when you're in that initial meeting and you're talking to that person, it is really vital that you take as much time as you can um, before you annoy them to ask them questions about why they're here, what's motivating them, what are the big challenges, and then frame your response to match what they said, not what you think is important, because what you think is important is completely irrelevant to them. And you will just, you you might be lucky, you might be describing exactly what their problem is and how you solve it, and then great. But if, if you had listened for a minute, you would quite quickly realize that they've just a tweak to your message stress, you know, I don't know, performance over reliability or reliability over performance. It doesn't matter which one is more important to them. You, if you find it out and stress that, you have a much better chance of, of moving your deal forward. And they don't want to know about your granny. They do not want to know about your granny. Um, I work with a lot of companies, as you said, at the start from Europe um, coming to the States. And they often start with, you know, they give me, I say, give me your slide deck, right? So I can see how you like to tell your story. And it always starts with, you know, my company was founded in the basement, you know, 10 years ago. We grew by this much and we grew, now we have 20 employees, whatever the number is. And I'm asleep before I finish that slide, right? That goes to the back of the deck. The first thing is there's a problem in business. This is what it is, right? Do you have this problem? right, for the client. So the client should see themselves in that first slide. Then you can talk about your solution and talk about the benefits. And then if they're still awake, (laughs) and that's key, then you can start saying, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, we founded this 10 years ago in the basement. Uh, How much time will they give you? So that's a hard one. Anybody's time now is is harder than ever. This is a theme. I think we could actually do a podcast series about time and the lack of it. I I agree. And I think that um, it's harder and harder to break through the noise. There's just more and more people doing it. There's more and more people finding hooks and things to try to get your attention. But the business people are, are, are not only being told you have more problems that you must solve for us. Uh, as you solve them, there are more hoops you're going to need to jump through, even internally before we'll even let you solve them, because we can't have you breaking the existing systems and processes and people that we have doing stuff. Um, and then there's more people tr- vying for their attention to help them solve those problems. So I'll, I'll typically go in looking for a 30 minute introductory meeting. I work very closely with these firms well before those meetings to make sure that whatever I'm going to say in those 30 minutes is right on point. When you say those firms, with your client or with the target? Uh, with with my client. So so I, the, the nomenclature we use at USAM Group is the vendors, right? So we represent the vendors going to, say, the clients who would be the buyers of the products. So I'll work with the vendors originally to say, you know, why do why should anybody care? You know, why do they want this meeting? What's their problem that's absolutely keeping them up at night and all that, you know, all those tropes? And how does this new offering that we're now bringing to market really solve all those problems and make them go away with, with the least amount of trouble for them to be able to implement it? And if you don't do that work up front, you'll run out of people to meet very quickly. <laughs> Because, you know, they'll cut you off. They will, and Americans will cut you off. Tell me, how abruptly? Quite abruptly, they'll, you know... What's the worst you ever suffered? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've had my fair share of embarrassments. Um, So we're looking for warts and all. I mean, I I certainly had cases where, you know, people would be gone in 10 minutes, but they would have junior people there. 
But right? do they stand up in the middle of stand a meeting? Stand up in the middle of a meeting, say, oh, sorry, look, I, I have to leave, but you're in good hands with Frank or Mary or Joe. But at which point you know this is over, yeah? This is over. Uh, have you I've ever done it. the same but opposite? Have you ever stood up and said, we're not going to do this? <sighs> my, if, again, my mother's listening. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I try to carry as much of my Irish heritage with me, which is much more friendly, much more engaging. And you can be polite. You know, it's nice to be nice. You know, if you can, sometimes you get frustrated, but, you know, you just have to say, look, it's not for me, but here's some good reasons and here's some tips on who else you could talk to. One of the founding fathers of Singapore ran a big campaign in Singapore for many years. And it was, there were banners everywhere. It's nice to be nice. Did he? Uh, there all, you go. It always makes me smile. <laughs> yeah. Because it was, not everything was so nice. As no, <laughs> no. Um, so what can you do for, we're, mm -hmm. our target is obviously Irish um, scalers, mm. scaling Irish. The scaling Irish, doesn't that sound? That's uh, very like, cool. <laughs> but that sounds you like should. something that should be a horror movie or something. The scaling <laughs> Irish. What can you do for them? Well, what we'd like to do is to sort of sit with companies, and, and we are somewhat focused, by the way, we're financial services, technology and content is our focus. Primarily financial services or anything wider than that, though? Insurance to a degree, but sort of okay. banking, capital markets, insurance would yeah. be our focus. And, and that's one of the key points I think any business school would teach you is to pick your strengths and, and stick to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is New York City. It is probably still the financial capital of the world. Uh, there's plenty plenty of business here. There's a lot of money sloshing around looking for answers to problems that they're having. So that's where we stay focused. And for those sorts of firms, it's really um, it's a finding a way into the market. Now, that isn't, uh, that's, that's harder said than done, even when you're doing well in, say, London, for example. You know, so maybe you, you started your, your fintech, as they say, in Dublin and you know, you've got a bunch of clients in, in London and maybe even some of them have branches in the States and you've been able to get, you know, some deployment over here. But there's still quite a bit of work to go from there. That's a great start, by the way. That's a really, really good start. And I wouldn't really bother coming here until you've done all that first. Done London. Done London, Dublin, you know, Paris, whatever, Frankfurt. Interesting, but that's specifically with the fintechs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because there's a lot of business there. There's a lot of big banks. There are a lot of, you know, trading firms, um, some uh, some of the biggest insurance companies in the world and so on. So if you can get your footprint there, build your value proposition, you know, understand why are they all buying it? You know, that's super, super helpful because the chances are that the people here are having the same or similar problem, not always identical. And that's the key thing. They often think, oh, well, Everybody bought it in London, they'll need it in New York. And it's like, no, maybe not. Like, you know, the regulations are different here. The systems work a little bit differently. You know, New York is typically ahead, I find, technically, like in terms of adopting newer technologies. Um, New York is always the first. And I've sold in Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, Toronto, London, you know, all around the place. But they beat me up harder in New York, you know, but they they eventually buy and they buy big and they deploy big. How lovely. Perfect segue because okay. I was wondering about that. When they do buy, they you are it's all in? You you know, they commit? They commit. Yeah. And when they commit, how quickly can they turn off the tap? Oh, once they're in, it's it's ten years. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they, we're talking enterprise. I'm typically selling technology. I mean, the data might may be less so, but it, but even then, once you once you start embedding it into your workflow and your process, even if it's different content that you have that you know adds some value, people help people analyze a company better or whatever. Somebody somewhere has a spreadsheet that uses a number out of your data set, and so if you want to turn it off. You got to find all those spreadsheets right? <laughs> or all the reports that people have and figure out, well, if we turn this off, who are we going to impact? And often they don't know. Like, it's quite hard to know where is this all this content going. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a big business around um, being able to track and monitor that, you know, because you have to charge correctly for it and you have to license it and report on it. But, you know, so same thing with the technology, like if you write some software to, to meet a certain goal or whatever, you're sticking with it for 10 years. Now, to broaden that out, you did say fintechs do London, Paris, mm. Frankfurt before you come here. You obviously, you're in business, you know people in business here, you're big in the Irish community here. Would you encourage people to come over here? And oh, 
I mean, it's the it's the crown jewel. I mean, if you're going to go anywhere, this is you know, if you want to make it anywhere, you make it here, you make it anywhere. You know, um, it remind me of you know when you somebody buys a car, say you buy a VW or something, yeah. and then I come along and say, "Do you like your VW?" Of course, you've already committed, haven't you? Exactly. So you're in New York, and yep. then you're seeing the praises yep. of New York. No, but uh, what you know the the New Yorkers they keep you honest. Right. So they really, they definitely push you to, to deliver on what you say, which is again, why you need to, you need to prepare well. Um, and you need to be ready to put the time and effort in, but they'll buy and they'll buy well and then they will support you. You know, it's one of the things that I, I, I originally was amazed by and now I fully understand it, you know, just why they were, you know, one bank would be willing to give another bank a reference for you. They don't always. It depends on how much of a competitive advantage you're providing them. So if you're front office where you're really allowing them make more money, they might not be as keen about telling people. But if you're back office where you're just streamlining a process and saving them money, they'll be very well inclined to share that info with other banks because they want you to, they need you to succeed. If they're, they buy your thing, you need to be here in 10 years time. You know, at least, and it could Very be twenty. Interesting. So yeah. they'll they'll go like, no, you should talk to these other guys, right? They may be able to, you know, be, be maybe interested too. And so once you get that f- footprint, um, you know, your foot in the door here, it it is a fantastic place to just. There's so many other firms like, and you don't even need need them all. You know, you get half of them or quarter of them. That's tens of millions of dollars. And as you know, we don't prep anybody on the questions because I never know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> but I am curious because again, you're here, you're in sales. And then beyond your own business, any opportunities did you think for Irish companies listening to say, you know what, there are opportunities in the US in this area, mm. broadest sense, anything that you ever say, I, I keep saying to people as you sit in the bath thinking, I don't know where you sure. th- do your thinking, but uh, yeah, yeah. What, do you ever come across big ideas, nice ideas, little opportunities? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do. And there are um, a lot of innovative companies that are, are coming up with ideas I haven't even thought of. Of course. Um, That's what makes them different. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what's hard, I think, is, you know, going from the wouldn't that be great to but how would we do it? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the one reason, again, why I say prepare before you come here, because you will be expected to execute. They don't great idea to how to migrate all your old databases to some cloud database or something like you just click a button and it goes uh, they want to know oh but does it work how will it do it how, what will happen to my old app you know so there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes so a lot of these great ideas are only good if you have the execution behind it so you know then the other thing is that you get hot topics and hot topics come and go, you know, there's just, they're always coming up with hot topics, right? AI is the hot topic right now, large language models, you know, which if you've played around with chat GPT, do seem magical until you sort of hit this point where you're like, oh yeah, but I, I couldn't use that, right? Like, you know, you say, oh, I could write the intro to your to your podcast automatically, but you would never just read whatever chat GPT gave you, right? I agree. You, you would Absolutely definitely have to agree. edit it. And so there's, there's a gap between what LLM and, and AI is promising and what people are willing to actually trust it for. So, you know, if I was to say, what's the hot topic, if you solve that problem... <laughs> Give okay. us a call. <laughs> well, well, I won't be giving you a call for a while. No. You know what our last question is to yes. all our guests? Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Uh, if he would be willing, I would take Tim Cook or Tim Apple, as another <laughs> previous leader like to call them. Well, what do you love uh, about the Cookie Monster? Well, I'll tell you what's great there is... Um, Obviously, anything he touches will turn to gold now because <laughs> he could just walk into any room, get a meeting with anybody. But it's that bit I talked about the execution side of things, right? Like the, the great ideas are wonderful. It's how do you deliver? And, you know, he's shown that. I mean, he, he, you know, Steve Jobs was, you know, sort of managing the vision side of things, but he always knew he had Tim behind the scenes to do it. And I, I'm amazed by him as well. Like since, you know, unfortunately, we lost Steve or whatever. He's run that operation so smoothly. They're not necessarily coming out with amazing vision, although I have to say those new goggle things look pretty good. I, I'm definitely going to try them out. Um, but, he, you know, just always one bit ahead. You don't have to have a brand new vision of some amazing. You just need to be that much further ahead and always deliver. And that guy always delivers. A better mousetrap. A better mousetrap, you know? 
Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us on that great business show, Fergal O'Sullivan. Tremendous. And anybody who wants to find you will find you at you, Sam, U-S-A-M. And he'll talk to you directly and he'll even show you a drum kit. But you can, <laughs> you can find out all about that when you talk to him and he'll sell for you and for others in the U.S., no matter where you are. That's I guess true. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Thank you, Connell. That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. And that's it from That Great Business Show, episode 170. Great business insights and inspirations, all thanks to our lovely sponsor, daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. And if you are looking for your first home, or maybe you're looking to upsize or downsize, do make sure you visit daft.ie to find that next place you call home. And before I go, a big shout out for our huge supporter, Marco Dwyer, founder of Big Red Cloud, who was awarded the All-Ireland Business Foundation Entrepreneur of the Year 2024, no less. He can add that to all his other triathlon and Ironman trophies that he's won over the years. So well done, Mark. Do sign up for email updates and we will send you your own personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Share, like, and give us five-star reviews too, please. It really does help. Advertise with us on That Great Business Show to engage with our incredibly gorgeous audience of entrepreneurs, business owners, and investors. And we record at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where today's studio engineer is Alison Houdouard. Later, the dynamic duo of studio manager Peter Rice and post-production engineer Neil Horner ensure we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. So for me, Conal O'Moran, we host to you all a